section is sponsored by established titles. Lucifer is a name you're probably familiar with. Lucifer is an angel in the Hebrew Bible whose fall from heaven is believed to have transformed him into Satan, the devil. He was once an exceptionally beautiful and powerful angel, and one of the closest to God. But in the end, his pride made him want to become like God, a forbidden desire that led God to cast him out and onto earth. The book of Revelation tells that one third of God's angels followed Satan and fell with him. But this is just one story of a mass angelic fall in Abrahamic lore. Darker and more devious mythologies have been told of a certain 200 angels who formed a conspiracy to share forbidden knowledge and mate with human women, whose giant hybrid offspring cannibalized and drank each other's blood. These ancient writings had a surprisingly large influence on Judaism and the early Christian church, who later rejected them for their disturbing demonology. Just remember, there's nothing to fear. Mr. Mythos is here. But yes, we're gonna investigate it all. The fall of the 200, as well as the fall of Lucifer, in obsessive detail. But before we dive in, I want to talk about titles, a rather important thing in angelology and demonology. These range from the Archangel Michael, Chief Prince of Israel, to the demon Dagon, Grand Pantler of the Royal Household of Satan. I've skimmed entire grimoires of who's who in heaven and hell, but I have to say, nothing compares to having your own title, made official by today's sponsor, Established Titles. Yes, Lord Mythos of Scotland is back. I decree that you observe my certificate with its unique plot number. I own one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Scotland, and in Scottish custom, landowners are referred to as lords and ladies. That makes me a lord. My domain may be limited to one square foot, but I've influenced lands far and wide. Established titles plants a tree with every order, a global reforestation effort. They work with one tree planted and trees for the future, and both these charities are just and true. I checked the reviews. So too is this established title. If you so desired, you could officially change your name to Lord or Lady on your credit card, plane tickets, and more. And as a last minute gift, it's one of the finest. How else to make your loved one feel like a lady or lord than to literally establish them with that title? And here is the final decree of Lord Mythos. The first 200 of you to purchase a title pack with my link will receive plots effectively next to my own. You'll get a 10% discount and together we might build a small empire. My kind thanks to established titles. Onward to the dark lore of the fallen angels. The term fallen angel doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible, nor in any other Abrahamic scripture. The description of angels falling, however, absolutely does. An angel always falls as a result of committing a sin, and usually a pretty bad one, but any sin will result in them being cast out of heaven. The Bible states that all angels were created sinless, but they do have free will. So the choice to commit a sin is always a fully conscious one, a thought-out act of rebellion, and thus the punishment is always severe. That said, the scripture describes three possible consequences. Some fallen angels are temporarily confined in the abyss. Others are eternally imprisoned in Tartarus, a place of punishment that the Greeks believed was worse than the hellscape Hades. And the rest are let loose to continue their sins on earth. They retained their angelic qualities of immortality and spiritual nature, but they lost their purity and heavenly position, and they'll never get them back. Fallen angels are unforgivable beings, and they all committed a sin. There's a big question on the table here. Are fallen angels demons? In my video last year, Demonology Explained in Obsessive Detail, I made one specific claim that many people disagreed with. The idea that demons are fallen angels. So let me just clear one thing up. In my demonology video, I was recounting the traditional Christian belief. Today's video is very different. We'll be looking at descriptions of the origin of demons not actually found in the Bible, but in the Book of Enoch, more accurately known as First Enoch. 
Most churches today consider First Enoch to be apocryphal, or not part of the true biblical canon, but several denominations would strongly disagree. The Eritrean Orthodox Church and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, as well as the Beta Israel Jews, and so too would many early theologians of Christianity. First Enoch's oldest verses were written around 300 BC, and it wasn't until around 380 that most churches rejected it as scripture. Interestingly, the biblical epistle of Jude, written around 50 AD, actually quotes First Enoch directly, which is remarkably strong evidence that it belongs as part of biblical canon. That said, the book was problematic from the beginning. The main issue was that its content was not only incredibly controversial, but disturbing. Some 200 angels have sexual intercourse with human women, which results in God transforming those women into bird-like monstrosities, but not before they gave birth to a race of ultra-violent giants known as the Nephilim, whose hunger was so insatiable that they'd go on to devour animals, humans, and eventually each other, and drink the blood of their victims. In Jewish tradition, the act of drinking blood is believed to be the ultimate violation of God's living creations. But for Christians, one aspect would prove even more offensive. First Enoch described the first sin, the origin of all sin, as not from Adam and Eve, but from the fallen angels. So who wrote this problematic text? Well, this brings us to one of the most mysterious figures in the Bible the patriarch Enoch, who the Bible only mentions once. Quote, And Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more, because God took him away. End quote. This passage makes Enoch one of only three humans to enter heaven alive, the other two being the prophet Elijah and Jesus Christ, according to Christian tradition. Clearly, Enoch was extremely important, yet the Bible fails to say anything else about him. But first, Enoch does. In fact, it was supposedly written by him after his tour of heaven and return to earth. According to the lore, out of the hundreds of texts he wrote, this was the only one to survive the flood God sent to reset the world, protected by his great-grandson Noah on his ark. Historically, though, this text would be lost for nearly a thousand years, from the 9th century AD until three copies were rediscovered in 1773, all written in Ge'ez, an ancient Ethiopian Semitic language. It turned out that not only did the Ethiopians never lose it, but they continued to treat First Enoch as a core part of their biblical canon. Today, these Ethiopian copies are the only complete versions we've found, though its accuracy would be proven with the later discovery of far more ancient Aramaic fragments. First Enoch is important because it tells the story of the sins of the Watchers. So, who are the Watchers? Well, a Watcher is an angel whose job is to watch over humanity and influence people, and particularly world leaders, on orders from God. They're mentioned in accepted canon, with three specific mentions of these beings in the Bible's book of Daniel. Suspiciously, in all three instances, the prophet Daniel goes out of his way to specify that the watchers he's describing are holy ones, in those exact words. That clearly implies the existence of unholy watchers, who the Bible never elaborates on. Or perhaps it does. The New Testament's epistle of Jude, the same I mentioned quoted First Enoch directly, went on to describe a certain group of angels who'd, quote, given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, end quote. To reveal the full story of the sins these fallen angels made and the monstrous consequences, we'll be exploring not only First Enoch, but other ancient Enochian works such as the Book of Giants and the Book of Jubilees, all truly apocalyptic mindbenders and largely rejected as canon. But First Enoch is where we'll begin, and specifically its first section, titled The Book of the Watchers. The Book of the Watchers takes place in an era several hundred years after creation and before the Flood, 
a time when the world was very different from the way we know it from written history. People lived extraordinarily long lives in blissful innocence and ignorance. It wasn't strange for a human and an angel to freely interact with one another. God sent these angels, known as the Watchers, to do just this, to live among the people, watch them, and guide them. However, this would lead to a problem. Despite the difference in species, the Watchers eventually became sexually attracted to human women. The following verse from chapter 6 of the Book of the Watchers is almost exactly the same as that found in chapter 6 of the Biblical Book of Genesis, by the way, as well as the Enochian books of Jubilees and Giants. It's a defining and unforgettable introduction. Quote, and it came to pass, when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw them, and lusted after them, and said to one another, Come, let us choose wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. End quote. The 69th chapter of First Enoch cites the angel Yakon as the first watcher to feel this temptation. Yakon approached the head chieftain of the watchers, the angel Samyaza, to organize a large-scale conspiracy to perform the forbidden copulation. It's not explained how Yakon convinced Semyaza, only that it wasn't long before a dark alliance of exactly 200 watchers gathered on the summit of Mount Hermon. Semyaza led the discussion, quote, I fear ye will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin, end quote. The chieftain was wrong. All 200 were equally wrapped up in temptation, and together they swore an oath to act on their plan, satisfy their carnal lusts and desires, and, if caught, face the consequences together. And so they did. The watchers flew down to earth and each chose a wife for themselves, and impregnated them. As these pregnancies progressed, the watchers decided to share their heavenly secrets with their new wives. This was the introduction of forbidden knowledge into the world, that of the astrological signs and phases of the celestial bodies, that of sorcery and magical spells, and that of herbalism, metallurgy, and even the secret truth of humanity's divine origin. God would later identify the knowledge shared by the angel Azazel as the worst of all. Quote, the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel, to him ascribe all sin." End quote. Azazel taught men metallurgy, how to create armor and weapons of war, and how to meld silver into jewelry to please women. Azazel would then teach women the art of seductive cosmetics such as eye paints and makeup, precious stones, and clothing dyes. Thus, Azazel was thought to be the root of promiscuity and violence on earth. The forbidden knowledge would also be shared with the Watcher's offspring once their wives had given birth. But these children, unlike the mothers, were not exactly human. Birthed of an unnatural, unholy matrimony between spiritual and mortal beings, these creatures were the Nephilim. Enochian literature describes the Nephilim as the true origin of the evil spirits we know as demons. This would be the ultimate fate of their souls after death, but in life, the Nephilim were monstrous giants made of flesh and blood. Just as the fall of the Watchers is referenced in the biblical epistle of Jude, the birth of the Nephilim is mentioned in the book of Genesis. Quote, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. End quote. This is the first of only two explicit references to these beings found in the Bible. While Genesis vaguely confirms their existence, the Book of Numbers makes it clear that the Nephilim are of gigantic stature. In this instance, several spies had been sent to survey Canaan, a land God promised to deliver to Israel. However, they were in for a big surprise. Quote, there we saw the Nephilim and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, as so were we in their sight." End quote. 
The Book of the Watchers gives the Nephilim's exact height, 300 cubits, or around 450 feet tall. We can assume they weren't born that large as the women survived the birth, but it does appear they grew up quickly. Their size, however, was a huge problem. Simply put, these 450 foot tall giants needed to be fed. Quote, the Nephilim consumed all of the acquisitions of men, and when the men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against the birds and beasts, and reptiles and fish, and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. End quote. As most living beings do when faced with starvation, the Nephilim did what they had to do to survive, even resorting to cannibalism. And the rampage of these desperate gigantic beings led to bloodshed and chaos across the earth. The conspiracy of the 200 Watchers could no longer be hidden. Looking down from heaven, the archangels Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel saw the state of the world and were utterly horrified. Immediately, they approached God at his throne, reported what they saw, and begged him for divine intervention. The all-knowing God was aware and decreed the punishments they must carry out. Quote, Bind Samyaza and his associates who have defiled themselves with women, when their sons, the Nephilim, have slain one another, and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind these watchers for seventy generations in the valleys of the earth, till the day of their judgment, when they shall be led off to the abyss of fire, to the torment and the prison in which they shall be confined forever. Bind Azazel hand and foot, and make an opening in the desert, and cast him therein and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there forever, and cover his face so that he may not see light." End quote. The archangel Gabriel then suggested that the Lord force the Nephilim into an endless and brutal civil war against each other, so that they may witness, suffer, and be the cause of the death of their own race. And God agreed to this idea. While the Nephilim would be faced with death, this death wouldn't be their final rest. God placed a curse on the Nephilim's spirit. God proceeded to make this declaration, quote, Now the giants who are produced from the spirits and flesh of angel and human shall be called evil spirits upon the earth, and on the earth shall be their dwelling. Evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies, because they are born from men and from the holy watchers, and they shall be evil spirits on earth, and evil spirits they shall be called." End quote. God explained further that their disembodied spirits would suffer endless hunger and thirst to torment and enrage them, and their fury would be directed toward humans. Thus the Nephilim would be the origin of demons on earth. There's much more to it though, so I saved an entire section in this video for these beings. As for the women who gave birth to the Nephilim, a later chapter of the Book of the Watchers reveals their punishment. Quote, the women of the angels who went astray shall become sirens. End quote. Sirens are hybrid creatures, half bird, half woman. We'll revisit them in a minute and their connection to the famous demon of Jewish folklore, Lilith. God's final punishment was ultimately something that all on the earth would suffer including the innocent. To God, the fallen watchers and the Nephilim had corrupted the entire world to such a degree that the only option was a complete reset. The Great Deluge, a giant flood that would, quote, cleanse the earth from all impurity and from all wrong and from all lawlessness and from all sin and godlessness and all impurities that have come upon the earth, remove, end quote. Nearly everything in existence would be killed and destroyed. Mankind could become righteous once again, but only with the earth wiped clean. God ordered the Archangel Uriel to fly down from heaven and warn the one person deemed worthy of survival, Enoch's great-grandson Noah, who'd be instructed to build an ark. 
The flood would unleash after a set number of years, and the clock was now ticking. In the meantime, God ordered Enoch himself to inform the Watchers of their punishment to come. Enoch first approached Azazel, then he announced it to the remaining 199 Watchers together. Quote, they were all afraid, and fear and trembling seized them, and they besought me to draw upon a petition for them that they might find forgiveness and to read their petition in the presence of the Lord. End quote. God had cut off all communication with the fallen watchers, so Enoch was their only hope. Enoch heeded their desperate request and pleaded for their fate. However, their severe and everlasting punishment would not change. God would show them no mercy, and they would never be forgiven for their sin. I mentioned that we'd explore the fate of the fallen women, and how they were transformed into monstrosities the Book of the Watchers refers to as sirens. As for what sirens are in this context, that's a bit debatable. In the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, there are several mentions of sirens without explicit description, but a bit more context given than First Enoch. The scholars argue they might describe a female owl, ostrich, or human hybrid creature. However, all agree that this is some sort of female creature that wails and cries. In Greek mythology, though, sirens are far clearer. They were indeed hybrid monsters, half woman, half bird. They lived on islands in the ocean, and with their beautiful hypnotic voice, they'd lure sailors to wreck their ship on the island's rocky coastline. Thus, sirens could be interpreted as a type of demon. The most important work in Jewish mysticism, the Zohar, actually reflects this belief. And as a side note, one really strange thing about the Zohar is that its contents seem to express an in-depth knowledge of the traditions and details of First Enoch. It's a mystery how this is even possible, because the Zohar was written in the 13th century, and during that time it was believed that First Enoch was completely lost. Anyway, back to the sirens, the Zohar actually suggests that it was the women themselves who seduced the Watchers, not the other way around. The first woman to do this was named Naamah. Quote, Naamah, the mother of the demons, by whom the first saints were seduced. She, Naamah, by her beauty, led astray the sons of God, Samyaza and Azazel, and she bore them children. And so from her went forth evil spirits and demons into the world. End quote. According to the Zohar, Naamah was transformed into a siren, the same described by Greek mythology, as were the other women who sinned with her. As the first, Naamah was cursed with the role of the mother of demons, whose duty is to carry out a multi-generational chain of tainted copulations, pregnancies, and births in order to produce the darkest of spirits. Quote, Naamah still exists, having her abode among the waves of the great sea. She goes forth and makes sport with men and conceives from them through their lustful dreams. From that lust she becomes pregnant. The sons whom she bears from human beings show themselves to the females of mankind, who become pregnant from them and bring forth spirits, and they all go to the ancient Lilith, who brings them up." End quote. Some of you may have heard of this being known as Lilith. Neither her nor Naamah are specifically mentioned in Enochian literature, but in Jewish folklore, Lilith is a very important figure. Actually, depending on the context, Lilith may be interpreted as either one individual being or an entire class of powerful female demons. In the Hebrew Bible, the word Lilith only appears once, specifically in the book of Isaiah. Quote, there shall the Lilith repose, and find for herself a place to rest. There the hoot owl shall nest and lay eggs, hatch them out and gather them in her shadow. End quote. There's a clear relation between a Lilith spirit and a siren, as both are evil beings associated with women and birds. The word Lilith itself is thought to be an ancient Hebrew term for a night bird. However, if we rewind back to the beginning of her story in Jewish tradition, 
you'll see that Lilith, the original one, was once a human woman. According to Jewish folklore, Lilith was actually the first wife of Adam in the Garden of Eden, not Eve. You might remember that the book of Genesis states that Eve was created from Adam's rib, basically as a derivative of God's original prototype. Lilith, on the other hand, was formed from the same clay as Adam and created at the same time. There was a problem though. Lilith wasn't a submissive woman. She was extremely independent. After refusing to serve Adam, Lilith left the Garden of Eden and would eventually couple with a certain archangel, Samael. She seduced Samael, became his wife, bred with him, and gave birth to demon children, notably a son named Asmodeus. Thus, Lilith and Samael are the demonological parallel to Adam and Eve. Many see the story as confirmation that Samael is the first fallen angel. And in this regard, Samael is the Jewish Talmudic equivalent of a far more well-known biblical figure, the devil Satan. But without getting ahead of ourselves, we're talking about folklore, not scripture. So there are truly many twists and turns in terms of the story of Lilith. Some accounts, such as the treatise on the left emanation, tell that God actually castrated Samael in order to stop him and Lilith from producing more demonic offspring. However, this led Lilith to seek intercourse with other men, human men, though she remained as Samael's partner. Turning back to the Zohar, there's a continuation of this tale, intertwining with the events that occurred after Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Their fall from Eden caused them to be separated from each other for 130 years. And during this time, Lilith actually went back and seduced Adam, and they had offspring together, two daughters, one of which was Naamah. As we know, Naamah would grow up to be the very first woman to seduce the Watchers, and from them, she birthed what the Zohar describes as demons. In the Judean Desert, 1947, just one year before the outbreak of a terrible conflict that wages on to this day, an Arab shepherd was searching for his lost goat when he stumbled upon the mouth of a dark cave. Thinking his goat ran in, he threw a rock in to scare it, but what rang back was the sound of shattered pottery. He brought back some friends to see what was in there, and they discovered an array of slender ceramic vases each filled with scrolls. They took the scrolls back to their camp and hung them up in their tent, trying to sell them. Multiple dealers told them that they were worthless forgeries and likely stolen. Finally, a friendly tribe leader referred them to a local shoemaker and part-time antique dealer who ended up buying the scrolls for around 340 modern US dollars. The problem was that these scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, were simply unbelievable. Most people, including archaeologists and scholars, found it impossible that manuscripts as old as they appeared to be could have possibly survived the eventful history and hazardous environment of the Judean desert for over 2,200 years. The oldest copy of the Hebrew Bible known at that time dated to the late 9th century AD, and the copy found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was from as early as the 3rd century BC. To this day, the Dead Sea Scrolls remain one of the most important discoveries in all of history. Beyond revelations of how the Old Testament we know today was worded in ancient times, there was a far more unexpected surprise in store. The scrolls also contained certain apocalyptic scriptures that were once incredibly influential but later rejected by religious authorities who labored to make them extinct from biblical canon. They were hidden in this cave so they might survive. These include First Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, and the Book of Giants. As First Enoch is the key to certain mysteries of the biblical book of Genesis, the Books of Jubilees and Giants are the keys to the questions left by the Book of Enoch, particularly regarding the Nephilim, the gigantic cannibalistic offspring of the Watchers, as well as the flood God sent to wipe them from the earth. 
In Enochian literature, it's strongly implied that the Nephilim's violent acts were what justified the flood. In the Book of the Watchers, they're described as eating humans, animals, and even each other alive, and drinking blood, the worst possible sin. They may have been unnatural products of forbidden copulation. However, the question is, were the Nephilim actually evil, terrible monsters by their very nature? Or was their brutality a result of their circumstances? God only described the Nephilim spirits as evil after placing his curse on them, not before. Unfortunately, First Enoch gives no details of them or their actions as individuals, and this leaves a noticeable gap in their lore. The Book of Giants, as the title suggests, is far more elaborate in its descriptions of these beings, as thinking, feeling, imperfect creatures, not so unlike us humans, only pushed by sizable circumstances out of their control. Just like humans, some Nephilim are, in fact, evil by nature, but others aren't. The Book of Giants tells of events in the Nephilim and Watcher community prior to the Flood. It's honestly a surprisingly action-packed story, and while I'm excited to jump in, there's a peculiar problem with the text itself that you need to be aware of. All Enochian literature tends to have multiple versions of varying degrees of difference, and in the case of the Book of Giants, there are only two to choose from, an extremely fragmented Aramaic copy found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and a still fragmented but far more complete Manichaean adaptation discovered in China. While both are very ancient, the Aramaic version is the oldest and most accurate to the original source, but it's nearly impossible to read. Simply put, the Manichaean version is more complete, and thankfully appears to be directly based on the Aramaic one, though certain details have been altered to fit the beliefs of Manichaeism, a once major religion founded by the prophet Mani in the 3rd century AD. Manichaeism is a truly fascinating religion, as it combined the traditions and beliefs of Judaism, Gnosticism, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, and even Buddhism, and even adopted many of their religious writings one of which was the Book of Giants. But this wasn't just any old text. The Book of Giants was one of the original six scriptures of the Manichaean church, and its adaptation was written by the prophet Mani himself. For our purposes, we'll mostly stick to the Aramaic version of the Book of Giants, and only rely on the Manichaean adaptation for a strikingly weird divergence in the very beginning, and another at the very end. So, the Book of Giants begins with Enochian literature's customary introduction, the retelling of the Watcher's lust for human women, the forbidden copulation, and the birth of their gigantic offspring. While both the Aramaic and Manichaean versions follow this, the big difference about the Manichaean adaptation is its premise. Because Gnosticism was a massive influence for the prophet Mani, in his reinterpretation, the Watchers aren't actually angels at all, but rather beings found in Gnostic lore, Archons. These are basically Archdemons who live in the cosmos. As the Manichaean scholar Walter Bruno Henning states, quote, The heavenly origin of the fallen Watchers did not square with Manny's conviction that no evil could come from good, therefore he transformed them into demons. Namely, those demons that, when the world was being constructed, had been imprisoned in the skies under the supervision of the Rex Honorus, the second son of the Manichaean god Mithra. They rebelled and were recaptured, but 200 of them escaped to the earth." End quote. So, having broken out of this prison-like structure in the nearby cosmos, the ones who got away chose Earth as their destination. In the Manichaean text, their reason was not only to hide there, but because their superpowered vision spied a vast number of young women whose beauty made them lust for them. Generally speaking, the Manichaean version continues with this darker, more ancient aliens esque interpretation of events, where these cosmic invaders proceed to force their desires and subjugate and enslave the human race. 
While that's fascinating in and of itself, it's a rather short section in the Book of Giants, and the two versions mostly align when we reach the main narrative of the Nephilim. What occurs with the Nephilim is a rather surprising act of mercy from God. In First Enoch, the Lord gives no hints of his sympathy for these beings. He pits them in a never-ending civil war, intends to drown the few survivors with an inescapable flood, and places a terrible everlasting curse on their very souls. This does come off as a bit excessive, and thus the Book of Giants answers this concern. The story tells that the merciful Lord actually sent prophetic warnings, as well as an opportunity for the Nephilim to repent. These warnings came in the form of dreams, first experienced by two Nephilim, one named Oya, the son of the chief watcher Samyaza, and the other named Mahwe. These dreams were so vivid and powerful that they felt compelled to share what they saw with the watchers and the other Nephilim. Mahwe's dream was of a stone tablet with many names written on it, and the tablet being submerged into water. When the tablet emerged, all names had been washed away except for three. To the reader, it's clear this was a prophetic vision of the deluge, the great flood to come, the remaining names representing Noah and his family, the only ones who'd survive. However, no Nephilim or Watcher was able to guess it, though they did interpret it as a sign that heavenly judgment was coming, and efforts to stop it would be futile. Oya's dream was similar to Mahwe's. Oya saw a large tree being pulled from the ground and uprooted, but stopped from being torn away completely by only three roots. The Nephilim and Watchers reached a similar conclusion. A massive punishment was coming, only a few would survive, and it would be utterly unstoppable. Oya panicked and insisted that, quote, It is not for us, but for Azazel for he did it." End quote. More dreams would come in the following days, each more ominous than the last. The Watchers and the Nephilim became plagued with anxiety. Finally, someone suggested that they ask Enoch for help, and pleaded with Mahwe to approach him. Mahwe agreed and undertook a cosmic journey to visit the Patriarch, and requested Enoch's interpretation and guidance. Enoch accepted, and left to speak to God in heaven. When he returned, he gifted Mahwe two massive twin tablets from God himself. Their message was overwhelmingly grim. However, it hid a vague invitation that may have changed their fate. Quote, Let it be known to you that the land is crying out and complaining about you and the deeds of your children, the harm that you have done to it. Until the archangel Raphael arrives, behold, destruction is coming, a great flood, and it will destroy all living things, and whatever is in the deserts and the seas. But now, loosen the bonds binding you to evil, and pray." End quote. This is where the Aramaic fragments end. It isn't the actual end, but the conclusion of the story is missing, and as of this date, a complete Aramaic copy of the Book of Giants has never been found. That said, the Manichaean version has its own ending, and it's surprisingly climactic. We have to rewind to the events before Mahwe was sent to visit Enoch, because in this version, Enoch actually visits their community himself, alongside a handful of heavenly helpers. Remember, unlike the Aramaic version whose watchers were morally complex beings who engaged in a conspiracy many would later regret, the Manichaean adaptation reinterprets the Watchers as wicked cosmic demons who are pure evil through and through. So Enoch descended with intentions to ease the worries of the Nephilim, beings not purely evil, unlike their fathers. However, their fathers, the 200 demonic archons, realized that they far outnumbered Enoch's heavenly guard, so they lunged at them and took these lesser angels hostage. This triggered an immediate emergency response from heaven. The clouds opened up and revealed four archangels rocketing down to stop them. Quote, and when the 200 demons saw those angels, they were very much afraid and worried. They assumed the shape of men and hid themselves. Thereupon, the angels forcibly removed the men from the demons 
laid them aside, and put a guard over them. End quote. The archangels arrived and quickly gathered up the innocent Nephilim not involved in the hostage situation. The archangels picked these giants up from the ground and flew them to safety, scattering them across 32 distant towns in the mountains, homesteads that God, omniscient as he is, had prepared for them long ago. When the archangels returned soon after, a massive, fiery battle broke out between them and the Watchers. The turning point, however, was the use of some sort of heavenly weapon. Quote, Those 200 demons fought a hard battle until the angels used fire, naphtha, and brimstone. The great fire of ruin that sets the worlds ablaze. On brilliant wings, they flew outside and above that fire, and gazed into its depth and height at those souls that may try to escape from the fire." End quote. I'm probably not alone in thinking this massive, world-burning, war-ending great fire of ruin sounds suspiciously like a description of an ancient nuclear weapon. Regardless, this was the final blow, and heaven was victorious. The four archangels proceeded to bind the Watchers with everlasting chains and cast them into a pitch-black subterranean prison located deep under the mountains. Finally, they annihilated their children, the Nephilim complicit in the plot. It's a dark end to the story, but it does imply that a number of innocent Nephilim were saved. And we might guess that these were the Nephilim who chose to heed God's advice to pray and repent for their sins. But what about the flood to come? Thankfully, we're not at the bottom of the rabbit hole just yet. For this, we'll steer our investigation to the next Enochian text on our list, the Book of Jubilees. The Book of Jubilees stands with First Enoch as an ancient text that was once highly regarded and influential in the Jewish and early Christian communities. And like First Enoch, Jubilees was eventually rejected as canonical scripture, except in Ethiopia, where in ancient times it was translated to Ge'ez and maintained as genuine biblical scripture. And as perhaps the most obvious evidence of its worth, the original keepers of the Dead Sea Scrolls found the Book of Jubilees so vital that they stored no less than 15 complete copies of it. That's more copies than the ones they kept for a vast majority of the books of the Hebrew Bible. And it's far more than what they kept of both First Enoch and the Book of Giants, so it's clear which one they preferred. Generally speaking, Enochian texts such as these serve to provide answers to the mysteries never properly explained in the biblical book of Genesis. One of the biggest, arguably, is what exactly justified the flood, an indiscriminate, world-wiping event. While Genesis simply blamed corruption and violence, First Enoch gave us the details, the book of giants took us into the action, and Jubilees summarizes what we've learned. Quote, Owing to these three things came the flood upon the earth, the fornification wherein the watchers went a-whoring after the daughters of men. They made the beginning of uncleanness, and they begat sons, the Nephilim, and they devoured one another. And after this they sinned against the beasts and birds, and all that moves and walks on the earth." End quote. Relevant to our investigation, Jubilees goes much further than any other Enochian text in two specific areas, the Great Flood and the demons it brought with it. The Book of Jubilees contains an unnervingly poetic description of the very moment the cataclysm came. Quote, the Lord opened seven floodgates of heaven, and the mouths of the fountains of the great deep, seven mouths in number, and the floodgates began to pour down water from heaven. Forty days and forty nights, and the fountains of the deep also sent up waters, until the whole world was full of water, and the Lord destroyed everything from the face of the earth. He destroyed everything. End quote. As we know, the flood is closely intertwined with the release of the first demons. The Nephilim who drowned would die, and from them, their cursed spirits would be torn from their bodies. Instead of ascending to heaven, they were damned to walk the earth until the final day of judgment. As the Book of the Watchers described, quote, The spirits of the giants afflict 
oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth, and they cause trouble. They take no food, but nevertheless hunger and thirst, and cause offenses." End quote. So the fuel of demons was, and still is, an unquenchable torment, almost a mirror of the one that drove them to brutal violence in their lifetime as Nephilim. It's a terrible fate. According to the Book of Jubilees, it was quite a while after the Great Flood had passed that the first true demons began to cause humans trouble. After Noah landed his ark, his three sons divided the earth and each claimed their own territory, and later they had sons of their own who further split the land. It was specifically at this point that the demons emerged to lead this new generation astray, toward corruption and death. After the first few casualties, Noah's sons informed him, and Noah made a desperate plea to God. Quote, let your free, unmerited pardon be lift up upon my sons, and let not wicked spirits rule over them. Imprison the demons, and hold them fast in the place of condemnation, and let them not bring destruction on the sons of your servant. For these are malignant, and created in order to destroy." End quote. Surprisingly, God decided to grant Noah his wish in full. He ordered that all the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim be bound. That said, trouble was lurking. The spirits had a leader, a shadowy entity referred to by the title Mastema, which translates to Prince of Hostility. Before his dark legions could be cast away, Mastema quickly offered the Lord an alternative option. Quote, Creator, let some of them remain before me, and let them listen to my voice and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men, for corruption and leading them astray before your judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And God said, Let the tenth part of them remain before him, Mastema, and let nine parts descend into the place of condemnation. End quote. Thus, while the overwhelming demonic population was greatly reduced, 10% would remain on earth under the leadership of Mastema. And just two verses later, it's confirmed who Mastema is, the devil known as Satan. Though God's flip-flopping may come off as strange, this was a win-win situation. Perhaps not for Noah, but for Satan and God. Demons are actually very important simply because their purpose is to make our lives miserable. Let me explain. The following infamous segment from the Book of the Watchers makes it dead clear that it's God's intention to make humans the target of demons. Quote, The spirits of the giants shall rise up against humankind because they have proceeded from them. The spirits having gone forth shall destroy without incurring judgment. Thus, they will make desolate until the day of the consummation of the great judgment. End quote. You might be asking, why would God want demons to torment us? Why does he encourage it in their very nature and enable them by removing any and all repercussions? These are good theological questions. Most find the answer in the biblical book of Job where a remarkably disturbing tale is told of a bet made between God and Satan. God boasted to Satan of a God-fearing, righteous man named Job, who, up to that point, had foiled all of Satan's temptations. Satan snapped back with a bold question, quote, Does Job fear God for no reason? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. End quote. Satan then proceeded to make Job's life absolutely miserable. He took his wealth, killed his livestock, killed his servants, and eventually even killed his children. He cursed Job's body with boils and pushed Job's friends to accuse him of sinning and tell him that he deserved his suffering. 
Job's every waking hour was non-stop suffering and despair for two entire years, during which Job repeatedly stated, I loathe my life, in more or less those words. And as Satan predicted, Job slowly developed a bitter hatred for God. He even considered filing a legal court case against God. Seriously. In the end, though, Job still feared God. Actually, he became so terrified that God had to intervene and command Job to be brave and put a stop to the challenge. In order to make it up to him, God restored Job's health, gave him twice as much wealth, and helped his wife bear new children. Of all the cruel things in the Bible, this one definitely ranks high, but returning to our question, why God encourages and enables demons to make our lives harder, it's a test of faith. And this test ends on Judgment Day. So while the fate of the Nephilim was to die and become demons, there's actually still more to the story of these cursed giants. Even though the flood was thought to have wiped out every living thing on earth, with exception to those on Noah's Ark, certain verses in the Hebrew Bible open up a big conflicting mystery here. As seems to be the trend, this mystery begins with the book of Genesis, quote, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward." End quote. Most scholars interpret this as a reference to post-flood Nephilim, survivors. And beyond Genesis, there is more canonical evidence of them. Earlier, I mentioned that in the Book of Numbers, several Israelite spies reported an entire population of Nephilim who occupied the land of Canaan. They not only explicitly called them Nephilim, but the spies described themselves feeling like tiny grasshoppers in comparison to them. According to most calculations, this was around 400 to 500 years after the Great Flood. These Nephilim hadn't just survived the Flood though, they thrived. The spies reported them living in large fortified cities and nourishing themselves with advanced agriculture. Specifically, their fruits were so gigantic that it would take two regular-sized adult men to transport even a single cluster of their grapes. The Nephilim of Canaan aren't the only post-flood giants mentioned in the Bible, but they are the only ones specifically referred to as Nephilim, and that's good enough to start speculating. The giant question is, how did the Nephilim survive the flood? In Jewish folktales, it's a popular mystery. Some claim that a few Nephilim clung to the sides of Noah's Ark, and others speculate that the wife of Ham, Noah's son, was a Nephilim, and she survived on the Ark with them. However, it's likely more that was an insult to Ham's wife, especially as Ham himself doesn't have a very good reputation in the Bible. Moving on to Islamic legend, a race of giants known as the Ad survived the flood simply because, standing at a height of around 100 feet, they were too tall to drown. Seeing as how the Nephilim in First Enoch were 450 feet tall, maybe it's possible. The book of Genesis specifies that, quote, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered, end quote. Thus around 22 feet above the highest mountain peaks. But consider that in the Book of Giants, the innocent Nephilim were relocated to 32 distant towns in the mountains, a rather convenient location. It was also described as one god specifically prepared for the Nephilim, and maybe that was to save them. Finally, another possibility is that the Watchers or some other angels continued to reproduce with human women after the Flood. While the original 200 Watchers may have been imprisoned for eternity, some have speculated that a new group of Watchers fell to the same old temptation a repeat of events that led to a new generation of Nephilim being born. No matter the truth, though, their fate would forever be the same. The Nephilim were cursed, and as mortals, even those who survived the flood were bound to die, as would their children and their children's children, a production line of demons, essentially. Perhaps the ancient humans realized this and drove the Nephilim to extinction in order to end the cycle. That might explain why there is no evidence of giants still living on Earth, although some conspiracy theorists might argue otherwise. 10% of the dead Nephilim remain, though, according to Enochian lore. 
disembodied evil spirits under the control of Mastema, otherwise known as Satan. This entity, Satan, is one of the most mysterious figures in scripture, folklore, and apocrypha. Primarily, this revolves around what Satan actually is. The final chapter of our demonological investigation will attempt to answer one question. Is Satan one and the same as Lucifer, the first fallen angel? I dug through some pretty dusty archives for the most obscure details I could find on this. And I can say, for such a well-known story, there's a lot of secrets you've never been told. In the biblical book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 12, a Hebrew word is found that translates either to son of the morning or the morning star, a reference to the planet Venus. Later Latin translations replace this descriptor with a name, Lucifer, which means light bringer. Just as in the morning, the planet Venus appears to shine far brighter than all other celestial bodies, minus the sun. The Bible defines the angel Lucifer as one of the highest of all angels, and one of the closest to God. The prophet Ezekiel described this angel as, quote, "...the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Every precious stone was his covering. He was the anointed cherub." End quote. Strength, brilliance, beauty, position. All these gifts given to him by God would ultimately make him forget that one truth. Lucifer's own greatness stirred a fire inside of him, of pride and eventually jealousy of the one being that outshined him. He said in his heart, quote, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High, end quote. This desire was what led him to fall from heaven. God's own hand pushed Lucifer off, and in the words of Jesus Christ, he fell like lightning. Lucifer was cast down to the earth. In Christian belief, this was the event that transformed the angel Lucifer into the devil Satan, and why most believe that Satan is, in fact, a fallen angel. Now, herein lies the puzzle. The problem is that no biblical verse explicitly states that Lucifer is Satan. Worse yet, verses such as that found in 2 Corinthians make things extra confusing. Quote, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. End quote. This verse makes it seem like Satan might not be an angel, but simply disguises himself as one to trick his victims. That said, there's a reason why most Christian traditions see them as the same being. There's a wealth of hints and evidence throughout the Bible. For example, the book of Job describes Satan appearing in heaven with the other sons of God, a biblical term used for angels. In passages of the Gospel of Matthew and the book of Revelation, Satan is described as the leader of fallen angels, an entire population of them. Revelation is also the scripture that Christians use to directly connect Lucifer to Satan, due to its words being poetic but strong parallels to the Old Testament's accounts of Lucifer's fall. Quote, War broke out in heaven. The archangel Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him." End quote. While the vast majority of Christian traditions agree that this links Satan to Lucifer, the question most people ask though is when exactly this event described in Revelation took place. Was it in the past, Satan's first and only fall from heaven? Or will it happen in the future, Satan's second and final fall? Thankfully, the answer is simple. Both Christian tradition and the vast majority of biblical scholars treat the book of Revelation as a prophecy of the future, and the context of this verse makes it clear that this event occurs during the final days. So Satan actually fell twice from heaven. 
or at least he will have, come the Day of Judgment. That said, while Revelation is, by and large, a vision of events to come, it does contain brief glimpses into the past. Most relevantly, a reference to Satan's fall in the past, his first, and it even adds another important detail to the lore. Quote, there another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. End quote. This verse may be metaphorical, but most agree on its meaning. That when Lucifer was cast out of heaven, he took one third of all angels with him. Or, more accurately, they followed him as their leader. This was the first mass fall of angels, before that of the 200 watchers. This verse in Revelation, combined with the two accounts of Lucifer's fall found in the books of Ezekiel and Isaiah, are all the Bible tells us about this event. As we know, apocryphal scriptures tend to exist in order to fill in gaps left by the Bible. However, the books of Enoch, Giants, and Jubilees never mention Lucifer's fall. And this extends to the vast majority of Apocrypha, surprisingly. Very few ever touched on this narrative. But for those who did, there is actually two completely different versions of the story. As for which one, if any, is the true account, that choice is up to you. We'll begin with the one probably very familiar to any of my Muslim viewers, because this origin story is the one told in the Quran. But perhaps my Jewish viewers will recognize it too, since it actually comes from Jewish tradition. The oldest Jewish apocryphon containing this story is known as the Life of Adam and Eve, which scholars widely agree dates back to the 1st century AD. That said, I want to switch things up a bit and give the Islamic version our focus here, especially as it goes quite a bit more in depth. But don't worry, I will point out exactly where the parallel is. So to set the context, in Islam, the devil's name is Iblis. Iblis is to Muslims what Satan is to Christians. He's the adversary of Allah, the name for God in Arabic. And he's the ruler of hell, commander of his demonic legions, and the visionary of their dark mission to tempt mankind toward the path of sin. In Islam, there are two interpretations of what the nature of Iblis is, based on details in the Quran, ancient traditional beliefs, and statements given by the companions of the Prophet Muhammad. One interpretation argues that Iblis was originally a jinn, a powerful spiritual entity usually thought of as demonic, but to be more accurate, jinn are morally ambiguous beings with free will, much like us humans. We'll be focusing on the other interpretation though, that Iblis was once the highest ranking archangel, the closest to the throne of Allah. According to Islamic legend, when Allah was forming the first man, Adam, from clay, he left him to dry for 40 days. And during this period, all the angels came to see Allah's new creation, and Iblis was among them. He looked at the clay body, frowned, and kicked it so hard with his foot that it reverberated with sound. Whether this myth is truth or lore is up to you, but the story in the Quran picks up from here and the following events are nearly an exact parallel to the Jewish version in the life of Adam and Eve. At this point, the creation of man was complete, and Allah breathed life into Adam. Then he turned toward his angels and ordered all of them to bow before Adam. So in Islamic tradition, humans are the most supreme creation, with the only being humans should bow to being Allah. Both jinn and angels are below mankind, so this is the reason why Allah ordered his angels to bow to Adam, in order to submit to his superiority and authority. The Jewish interpretation is a bit different though. In Jewish belief, mankind was made in God's own image. Thus, God asked his angels to bow to Adam in worship of the image of God. That difference aside, the outcome is the same in both the Islamic and Jewish versions. As ordered, all of the angels bow to Adam. All except for one. As written in the Quran, Iblis flat out refused. Quote, 
I am better than he. Thou hast created me out of fire, whereas him thou hast created out of clay. And Allah said, Down with thee then from the state. Among the humiliated shalt thou be. End quote. Allah promised Iblis eternal hell for his defiance, but this fallen angel was not ready to go. Iblis responded, quote, Grant me a respite till the day when all shall be raised from the dead. End quote. In saying this, Iblis challenged Allah directly, similar to how Satan challenged God in the book of Job. If Allah gave Iblis ample time before his doom in hell, how many descendants of Adam could he lead astray? Allah accepted and placed his wager. Iblis was given till the day of judgment to tempt all but the most true and devout believers toward the path of sin. But despite Iblis's wish granted, his response immediately after was rather bizarre. Iblis bitterly blamed the Almighty for his own fall. Quote, Thou hast thwarted me. I shall most certainly lie in ambush for them all, and most of them thou wilt find ungrateful." End quote. This response has confused many over the centuries, specifically that first part, thou hast thwarted me, as if Iblis was in complete ignorance of the sin he just committed that led to Allah casting him out as an angel. This is why many Muslims believe that it was during this very moment that evil took over his entire being. Allah transformed the first angel into Iblis, the devil, an evil entity driven by the hurt of a seemingly unjust betrayal and absolute confidence in his singular goal, to win the bet. But here's the kicker. The majority of Islamic scholars purport that angels have no free will, none, very different from Christian belief. So if that's true, Allah was the reason why Iblis refused to bow to Adam. As a pawn in Allah's plan, each move laid out perfectly from beginning to the end of time, it was Allah who caused Iblis's fall. All right. That's the first narrative. Iblis, or Satan, refused to bow to Adam. But as I mentioned, there's an alternative version, one whose legacy wasn't made through religious scripture or apocrypha, but instead its lasting significance in popular culture. You've probably heard of Paradise Lost, the 17th century epic poem written by John Milton. Paradise Lost is a genuine classic and deserving of its reputation as a masterpiece of literature. However, it's not the first text to tell this story. In fact, Paradise Lost borrows heavily from a far older and incomparably more obscure text, the old English epic today referred to as Genesis B. As the name implies, there's also a Genesis A because the manuscript these two works were rediscovered and combined them as one. However, later on, fragments of older copies were found and proved that the two were originally separate. The oldest known copy of Genesis B was written in the early 9th century AD. Before then, it had been passed down in oral tradition for hundreds of years and possibly dating back to the early days of Christianity. And this implies that Genesis B may have not been intended purely for storytelling, but as a medium of religious truth. The respected world authority on Genesis A and B, Dr. Alger Nick Tone, remarked, quote, It seems safe to say that this is theologically, if not dramatically, the most sophisticated and complete realization of this topic, end quote. That topic is the fall of Lucifer and his transformation into Satan. The infamous fallen angel is the main character, and the story is told from his eyes. So, if it's good enough for the expert Dr. Doan, we might take a leap of faith and treat Genesis B the same as we did Enochian literature. Controversial to biblical canon, but accurate to the lore. And while it begins with familiar details, trust me, after the fall, it gets a bit more complicated. Quote, the Holy Lord, through his hand power, created ten kindred of angels. In them he trusted well, but one among them he had made so strong 
God allowed him to wield such power, highest after himself in the heavens. But this one turned himself away. His angel began to become overly proud. Why must I toil? He asked. There is no need at all for me to have a master. I can mold many wondrous things with my own hands. I can be a god just like him. Strong warriors stand beside me. They have chosen me as their lord. End quote. Eventually, God heard word of Lucifer's prideful boasts and his conspiracy to carry out a large-scale coup in heaven. Thus, God swelled with anger and enacted his punishment. Quote, the Lord cast him into hell, into the deep chasm where he changed into a devil, the enemy with all his allies. They fell down from heaven a very long time, three nights and days, those angels from heaven into hell. The Lord wrought him a name ever since. The most lofty, said God, must thenceforth be called Satan. End quote. Now in hell, the fallen angels were in absolute agony. Satan bitterly vented to his followers, quote, This narrow place is much unlike the other home that we knew. He had no right to render this. Most sorrow to me is God's creation of mankind. That Adam, who was shaped from the earth, shall possess my fortified throne and dwell there in joy. Well, we must suffer this torment and injury in hell. I am without power. A tormenting chain of rings has prevented me from moving. End quote. Satan went on to describe the huge iron fetters and bolts binding his hands, feet, and even neck, and that even if he could move, his personal prison cell in hell was barred shut. Satan would never be able to escape but he did see a clear opportunity to get revenge. As God took away the light from Satan and his angels, Satan would take away the light God gave to mankind in their creation. He declared, quote, Consider it, all of you. Consider how you might deceive them. I could rest me more easily in these chains afterwards if the light were lost to them. He that fulfills this task for him will be a ready reward forever after. I shall let him sit with me myself. End quote. This is the point where the Genesis B text begins to conflict with traditional Christian beliefs, because Satan is permanently bound to his prison. Thus, the serpent in the Garden of Eden wasn't Satan himself, but a different fallen angel. Unfortunately, immediately after this monologue, two entire sections are missing from the Genesis B manuscript, as if someone tore them out. So, we don't know who exactly this fallen angel was. The narrative picks back up as this dark being flies out of hell to carry out Satan's plan. He successfully fools Adam and Eve into eating the forbidden fruit and praises his master, Satan yearning to return to hell to be at Satan's side and claim his prize. Whoever this fallen angel was, he'd become the surrogate of Satan, the proxy through which the devil, bound by his chains and cell walls, could freely perform his acts of evil on earth. This particular detail is one of the biggest reasons why there is a surprising amount of controversy surrounding Genesis B. It's a major twist of interpretation, suggesting that Satan's appearances in the Bible might not actually be him, but this unknown fallen angel. But a surrogate of the devil may not be as strange as it seems. In the Old Testament, it's rather apparent that God has his own surrogate. I actually investigated this in depth in my video on angelology, the being referred to as the angel of the Lord. However, there is at least one confirmed appearance of the true devil in the Bible. The book of Revelation foretells of future events where Satan is bound by a great chain and locked in the abyss for a thousand years, then let back out again to cause destruction, then locked away once again, this time in the lake of fire. Just as the evil spirits of the dead Nephilim serve a purpose for God, so does Satan. 
Hence why God loosens his chains on occasion, only to tie him back up due to the enormous destruction he causes. That and his tendency to wage war on heaven. So, returning to Genesis B, after Satan's surrogate planted the seeds of sin in mankind, the narrative carries on to other events written of in the book of Genesis. It details every generation, even describing the life of the patriarch Enoch himself, as well as his living ascent to heaven. Further generations pass, and finally we arrive at the events described in the book of the Watchers. Quote, the people multiplied throughout Middle-earth sons and daughters, up to now precious to the Lord and glory blessed, until the sons of God began to seek out wives among the kindred. The Lord wished to set his punishment on the angels, strike the sinful of deeds into death, the kindred of giants unbeloved by God. The Lord would kill them all in days to come." End quote. As obscure as Genesis B is, in the world of fallen angel demonology, it's an important text. The narrative includes both the fall of Lucifer and the fall of the Watchers in a defined timeline. It mentions the giants, the Nephilim, and ties their sins to the flood. It integrates Enochian lore, but its focus is elsewhere, and it's provocative, just like the rest. We might say that Genesis B, along with First Enoch, the Book of Giants, Jubilees, and the life of Adam and Eve are all fallen angels of religious texts because they walk a very different path. They challenge